In particular for tonight, our featured scientist is a partnering researcher that's coming to us from Chapel Hill. She is a leader in the study of metabolism and inflammation of white blood cells and the relation to obesity and diabetes. She earned her PhD in nutritional biochemistry from the Harvard School of Public Health, and she has since developed quite an accomplished career in her field, earning several awards along the way, in particular from the National Institute of Health, the Pathway to Independence Award, quite an accomplishment. She is currently with the UNC Gillings School of Global Public Health in the Division of Biochemistry. The Nutrition Research Institute is pleased to partner with such talent. Ladies and gentlemen, introducing Dr. Liza Mikowski. Um, hi everyone, I want to thank you for coming out today and I know that my family is watching over the internet tonight so it's really exciting. Um, and I wanted to just uh, emphasize that I'm an assistant professor in nutrition so I do research on um, nutrition and metabolism and I'd love to take some of your questions at the end of the talk. So let's see, um, today I'm going to talk about obesity. And at first, it's simply basically an imbalance between consumption and um, energy expenditure. But it's actually a lot more complicated. So why is there such an obesity epidemic right now? Um, so is it in our DNA? Is it just genetic? Is there epigenetics, which you might have heard about in your talk um, previously? There's, um, of course, advertising, where you see here on the top, there's a, a warning about childhood obesity right next to a McDonald's advertisement. There's actually gut bacteria. There's the food that we're getting served, these double down sandwiches from KFC. Um, portion sizes are increasing over the past few years. Um, of course, the cost of, uh, the cost of uh, healthy food, as well as access to healthy food. And of course, our lifestyle changes. So sitting at a computer, which is basically my lifestyle. Um, and so the question is, is this um, urban lifestyle, our new normal. So have we gone from the hunter-gatherer to the person sitting at the computer eating fast food? And so what I'll talk a little bit about is introducing obesity and then tell you a little bit about my research. So uh, the body mass index is something that can calculate, um, uh, it's, it's a quick measure to calculate um, basically an index of obesity that takes into account um, weight and height. And the healthy body mass index is between 20 and 25. And right now, um, over two-thirds of the population of adults are overweight in the U.S. They have a BMI over 25, so I'm overweight right now, unfortunately. Um, and a third of the public uh, adults are obese, and that is a BMI over 30. And so you can see that there's actually increased health risk with increasing body mass index, or BMI. So this is something that's a measure that we've got to watch. And uh, what I'll show you now is a series of slides that are actually stunning. These are statistics taken, and they chart the percent of the population that's obese. So the percent of the population with a BMI over 30. And you could see this is 1985. Um, about 1 in 10, this is the, the blue color, is about 1 in 10 people is obese. Five years later, this is the number of states with 1 in 10 people obese. Another five years later, we're going into 19 or 20% obese. Another five years later, up to one in four, 25% of the population is obese. Another five years later, we're going up to 30% of the population and the dark red is becoming obese. And so this is, you could see this almost a 20 year trend from the 90s to 2009, where we see some of these states having up to 30% of the population obese. And it's quite striking, and it's obviously an epidemic. Um, and it also can be segregated by races. Race. So um, we see the, these are just percent of the population, again, obese, and we see really high prevalence in um, the black and Hispanic populations compared to Caucasians. So there's obviously health disparities here. And what about diabetes? I'll talk a little bit about diabetes because you can see with increasing obesity trends that there's increasing uh, diabetes. And not everyone who gets, uh, who's obese gets diabetes, 
But the, the darkest color here, you see one in 10 of the population has diabetes in some of these states, and it's a lot of the southern states. And of course, it's also a global epidemic. So this is, we are not only exporting our Western technology, but we're exporting our le Western lifestyle. So um, this, the rest of the uh, Earth has not been projecting very well. But you can see the US, Canada, South America, Europe are having um, uh, huge instances of obesity, including China. And India, India is the number one country getting diabetes right now. So this is a global epidemic. And the complications of obesity are um, obvious, and some are not as obvious. Uh, sleep apnea, for example, is something that can disturb sleep. Um, gynecological abnormalities and fertility, um, skin problems, cancer, such as breast cancer, uh, diabetes, obviously, um, heart disease, and uh, many other problems are associated with this epidemic. So um, now we get to what we're interested in, is how can we control obesity? And um, like I said in the beginning, this imbalance. So we can eat less, we can exercise, or there's surgery. And um, gastric bypass surgery works for a lot of people, but it's a, it's a tremendous lifestyle change, so it doesn't always work for everybody. But what I'm interested in is getting more into the, the nitty gritty to try to understand other ways to modify obesity. And that is understanding the microenvironment. So this, this is a picture from Science, which is one of the best journals we could ever dream of publishing in. And on the cover, you see that there's, um, this is adipose tissue or fat tissue. And it's a, um, it's a scanning electron micrograph. So it's just a really cool picture. These are fat cells. The little round balls are fat cells. And the yellow on the outside is connective tissue. And it's been known for about 15 or 20 years that inflammation and mediators like cytokines like TNF-alpha are associated with obesity and insulin resistance. But recently, and what my particular interest is, in the microenvironment. So what's going on in the adipose tissue? And for example, macrophages. This is a picture of a macrophage with part of its cell membrane reaching out. So it, it looks like a burning ball of fire, but it's actually a cell. And those macrophages are inside this adipose tissue. So that's what I'll talk to you a little bit about today. And so what are macrophages? They're white blood cells in, in the hematopoietic um, development. They're right at the, they're the end. They're a terminally differentiated cell. And you could kind of think of them as a soldier. So they're there to fight. So they're white blood cells that are normally thought of in the immune system fighting off bacteria <laughs> or something. But they're actually going to be important in obesity. So in 2003, there were several groundbreaking papers showing that macrophages are present in adipose tissue. And this was really amazing to the field. And if you look at this, this is a histological section. So you take a, a slice of adipose tissue and you look at it under the microscope. And you can see that the, the little lines here are fat cells. And what scientists can do is use an antibody to stain for a protein on a macrophage. This is called F480. It's not really important, but it's a macrophage marker. And you can see some detection in the leans, a little bit more detection in the obese, and a lot of detection of this, these macrophages in uh, the very, very obese. And so these macrophages are infiltrating and aggregating in adipose tissue. And it's thought that they might be surrounding dying adipocytes. And you can see there where the arrow's pointing, the blue arrow is pointing to, is that they seem to be surrounding an adipocyte, and it's called a crown-like structure because it's supposed to look like a crown. It's a little bit hard to understand. Um, but there's a lot of debate in the field why this is happening. And just a few guesses are that perhaps adipose tissue is starving for oxygen. There might be some other cell death, like maybe these adipocytes are dying and the macrophages are coming in. Um, some other stresses or maybe some fatty acids getting released. But really, it's, it's not known, and it's a really hot topic of research right now. But um, so just really briefly, I just wanted to say, like, what, how do we study obesity in the lab? So there's biochemists out there, and they might study enzymes in a test tube. Um, there's people who do molecular biology, like cell culture. So you're growing cells in culture. You can study one type of cell. You can do co-culture co of two type of cells, which is getting even cooler. You can do 3D co-culture, like where cells are held under tension, like a muscle cell. So that's really you know, cool. Um, then you can even get even bigger. You can take parts of organs and culture them in tissue, in tissue culture plates. Um, 
But then ultimately, you want to do this. It's really hard to study obesity in cells, so you need to study this in, in uh, an animal model. So the whole shebang, you get the whole animal model. And then ultimately, you want to take that to human populations. And so next, uh, in a couple of weeks, Beth Meyer Davis will talk to you about diabetes. And um, she, she studies human populations. But um, so what I'm particularly interested in is animal models of obesity. Because um, what we do is we feed them a high-fat diet. And just for note, the, the average American diet is about 30 to, in the worst takeout food, you know, delicious dinner, is about 45% of the calories coming from fat. So we can feed, we can model that by feeding that to animals. And it's easy because they love to eat. Um, we, we can control the genetics of animals, but you can't really control the genetics of humans, obviously, because everybody's so different. And um, it's easy to control what these animals are exposed to. So we can expose them to this diet or that diet. And um, then we go and study obesity there. So most people study, uh, they, they use certain diets for studying uh, rodent obesity. And first is that they're basically fed a chow pellet. And that's like oats, rice, wheat, uh, all ground up. So it's a pretty, it's like a granola bar, basically, diet. And then what, what we do as scientists is we buy these funny, they just dye these different pellets certain colors, and they're different amounts of lard, high-fat diets. So it's like saturated fat, delicious, buttery diets. And these can have a low-fat diet or a high-fat diet. And they are basically either calories coming, 10% uh, of the calories from fat, lard, or 45%. And um, they also add some sucrose to these diets. So the low fat is actually high sucrose. The high fat is low sucrose. And whereas these pellets are about 10% coming from fat. Um, but the question is, what do people really eat? And, and we eat a lot of snacks and junk food. And even some data from our department recently from Barry Popkins shows in over 30,000 kids under six that there's up to 27% of their caloric intake currently is snacks. And um, that is up 200 calories from 30 years ago. So it's quite striking, this change. And we know that's true because we see our celebrities eating and feeding their kids Cheetos and um, uh, Sunkiss soda. And I have to admit, I have a five-year-old and four-year-old, and I could probably take a picture of them eating uh, Cheetos too. So I'm not perfect either. But um, what we're interested in the lab is we wanted to compare these diet that most researchers are using, this lard-based diet, to a cafeteria diet study. The cafeteria diet is basically human food diet. And so we literally went to the grocery store and you buy all this food, keep it at your desk, and we fed it to the animals, including chocolate, pepperoni, um, snack cakes. So they get carbohydrates, protein, and we varied it every day. And let me tell you, they loved it. And it's about 50% calories from fat. So, <laughs> so uh, there's pros and cons to everything you do in the lab. So the pros of this cafeteria diet, or the junk food diet, is that it's actual foods that humans are eating. So it's quite, we can, might be able to compare that to uh, humans. It's extremely palatable, so it's tasty. Um, and it's energy dense, and I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. And it engages the addiction and reward system. So it's actually used commonly in neurology studies where people are looking at appetite and behavior. But the cons are that it's not a defined diet. So it's not a purified, manufactured diet like those little colorful pellets. So when you buy a colorful pellet from a store, uh, from a, um, um, a manufacturer, we know exactly what they put in, vitamins, everything. So these diets, um, although you might have your Reese's Pieces uh, labeled, we're not quite sure what's exactly in there. Um, the other caveat is that although I'm talking a little bit about fat here, it's also high in trans fat, cholesterol, salt, all these things that make it delicious and palatable. It's low in fiber, uh, low in vitamins, and it's also pretty hard work because you can't just buy something and add it to the animals. You have to actually work pretty hard at getting the different foods and variety. But most importantly is that I'm not here to claim that there's any one cause of this obesity that I'll talk about. I cannot say it's fat. I cannot say it's trans fat. It might be low fiber. It might be uh, <clears throat> any other micronutrient. Um, so, but I think it's a really interesting model to study obesity. And so just really briefly, I wanted to touch on caloric density. So caloric density is basically taking good food and making it incredibly dense and palatable and high calorie. And that's a big problem right now. So you can take a pound 
of corn, and that's about 500 calories. If you turn that into tortillas, it doubles it. But if you turn it into delicious, crispy tortilla chips, that's five times the amount of calories per pound. So it's really an energy-dense food that is essentially not good for us. Okay, so now let's look at some of the animal data. So if, if you look at the top two, LFD is low-fat diet, and HFD is high-fat diet. So this is what most researchers are using, the 10% and the 45% fat from lard. And then we compared it to the chow, those little brown pellets that are ground up oats, and then our cafeteria diet. And if you look, this is calorie intake. And you can see a striking dis, uh, difference. Even at one week of offering this food, we see this huge increase in food intake. And interestingly, the high fat diet, you can see that little black square increases at one week, but they actually can auto-regulate their um, appetite and decrease their food intake. Because in general, uh, we tend to maintain weight. But what's, what we learned here is that cafeteria diet is so delicious and palatable that they lose that ability to downregulate their um, caloric intake. And so what happens with weight gain? Well, they gain tremendous amount of weight. In the top is the blue circle, the cafeteria diet. So compared to the standard chow on the bottom, the low and the high fat are intermediate. These guys are getting tons of weight, so they're giant. And they just, they just can't stop themselves eating this diet. Um, but getting back to what I was interested in, in the microenvironment. So what we did is we were able to take out their, their white fat. And this is adipose tissue. We weighed the fat. And you could see in the light bar, um, the, the standard chow pellet um, fed animals are very lean, very healthy. The low fat and the high fat are intermediate, and in the dark blue, the cafeteria diet had giant fat pads. They were massively obese. Um, and so we were able to take histological slices of that and look at it under the microscope, because we wanted to focus on the microenvironment. So again, if we focus just on the low fat diet and the high fat diet, which is what most researchers are using with the lard-based diet, we see when we stain for that macrophage marker again and look at crown-like structures, we see an increase in inflammation with high-fat diet in adipose, which is what we expected. But then when we compare it to the standard chow pellet and the cafeteria, the cafeteria diet had tremendous obesity and tremendous inflammation. And not just the crown-like structures, but they also had, we also marked some areas of just inflammation, just tons of inflammatory immune cells. And we, when we went back and counted all those crown-like structures that we saw um, of macrophages, the cafeteria in the dark blue had tremendous amounts of crown-like structure and inflammation. And we also looked at some inflammatory markers, these cytokines, TNF-alpha, for example. And that was elevated also um, in the cafeteria diet. So we know that this is a very inflamed tissue. And there's another type of fat tissue called brown fat. And this is actually good fat. It helps burn off energy and waste energy. And uh, to date, there's really nothing known about macrophages and um, white blood cells and brown fat. So we were able to look at the brown fat. And without getting into too much detail, see the standard chow. These are the pellet fed. They have a really nice red, beautiful um, um, section of their brown fat. And the cafeteria fat are just uh, cafeteria fed animals are just full of fat. And again, we see macrophages accumulating here. Same goes for liver. So these guys have a tremendous fatty liver. And if you kind of squint, you could just see that the cafeteria diet, they have a pink liver. It's so full of fat. And again, focusing again on the um, macrophages, we have lots of staining for macrophages. And so they basically have this sick liver, which happens in humans too. Um, and so as a scientist, you really need to get at a mechanism, and that's, that's our ultimate quest, is a mechanism. How is this happening? And one thing we did was to look at metabolites, and these are basically biochemical intermediates. And um, unfortunately, this isn't in your handout, because I added it recently. Um, so we looked at a metabolite of saturated fatty acid. This is just a C12 uh, acyl carnitine. And if you look at how we correlated that to the crown-like structures on the bottom and the acyl carnitines on the uh, y-axis. And you could see the standard chows have very low crown-like structures and low um, of this intermediate. Low fat and high fat are progressively higher. And you could see the cafeteria diet um, animals have tons of this inflammatory mediator and tons of the crown-like structure. So for example, this was one way for us to do a global analysis of the metabolomics 
uh, profile and find this marker that may be something we can pursue in the future. And so then just to summarize, uh, the cafeteria diet model that I talked about today is a really robust model of diet-induced obesity. And um, it, there's evidence of metabolic syndrome. And this is very severe compared to the traditional high-fat diet. So we see the rapid induction of obesity and fat accumulation. Um, these mice, I mean, these rats become pre-diabetic. I didn't talk about that today, but we also saw really dysfunctional uh, beta cells in the pancreas. So their glucose has started going higher. Their insulins were very high. Um, and then we see tons of inflammation in the adipose and the uh, liver. And as a little bit, what I touched on is some metabolomic analysis where we looked at biochemical intermediates as well as genomic analysis I didn't show you today, which is looking at RNA expression of genes. And both of those are pointing us to inflammation as well as some oxidative stress pathways. And so uh, just to remind you that we have this epidemic and there's probably a bunch of different reasons why there's increased obesity. Um, but just in terms of focusing on, on how we can control this, you know, unfortunately, we've known about this epidemic for quite a while. We've known obesity has been increasing. Everybody's trying to eat less. You either eat less carbs or you eat less fat or you try to exercise more. You're getting surgeries, and it's just it's, it's not very successful. So my hope is that we can go back to that microenvironment and the white blood cells and manipulate them. So uh, what my lab is currently working on, this is a picture of us in the um, School of Public Health at UNC, and we want to manipulate that microenvironment. And um, so the good news, there's good news here, is that we can manipulate this macrophages by manipulating their metabolism. And so remember I showed you that as you get more and more obese, there's more macrophages. And actually, there's in my, this is my happy Pac-Man, in the lean tissue, there's actually a type of macrophage called the M2 macrophage. And it doesn't really matter what it's called, but basically it's a good macrophage. It's there like the Pac-Man to chew up adipose tissue. It's probably involved in just maintenance and uh, cell turnover. So it's a good macrophage and it's, it's normal. Um, what's bad is that when you get obese, a different type of macrophage called the M1 is the one that's infiltrating in. And so this is the nasty macrophage and this is my really mean Pac-Man. Um, so, so the point is, that there's actually subtypes of these macrophages. And what my lab is working on is can we turn these bad macrophages good? And um, uh, so we have really early data, and maybe I'll come back in a few years and be able to show you more solid data that uh, we might be able to manipulate this uh, macrophage profile in the obese tissue to hopefully improve the um, obesity and diabetic state, at least of animals, and then maybe uh, start getting some human studies. And so I just want to conclude about what I've told you today, is that we know obesity and diabetes um, are ep epidemics in the US and worldwide. Um, <clears throat> in the lab, a lot of researchers are trying to study obesity with high fat diets, and they're using a lard based diet. But I'm proposing that using this human junk food diet is actually more appropriate to what we're eating, and it's also a lot more dramatic and more severe. Um, <clears throat> and we believe that possibly targeting inflammation in the fat microenvironment or the tissue of the, ad the adipose tissue might be the future of obesity research. And um, again, I want to acknowledge my lab because they've worked really hard uh, in the past year on all this work. Um, we have uh, some postdocs and my undergrad who didn't make the picture. And um, I really want to acknowledge my collaborators on this cafeteria diet because, um, of course, you, we can't do this all ourselves. This is a really big study. Um, Tom O'Connell does metabolomics at UNC, and he helped with a lot of the analysis because you just get all this data back. It's overwhelming. So uh, he helped us with bioinformatic analysis. And also Pei Fen Kwan at uh, Lineberger helped us with that. Uh, my collaborator, Patrick Fieger, helped us with the pancreas uh, beta cell analysis for the diabetic phenotype. And um, a lot of this work was done in collaboration with Chris Newgard, Amanda Van Hoos, and the Stedman Center core at Duke, where we did the metabolomic analysis. And then I didn't talk today about manipulating my macrophages, but these are some collaborators. And of course, I have to thank my funding, too, which uh, allows me to keep the lab going. 
And um, if you wanted an update of the PowerPoint slides, I can mail them to you. Or if you have any questions, you can always email me at my address here. Or you could ask questions now. So please uh, go ahead. Thank you. Should work. All right. Yeah. Terrific. All right. Does anybody have any questions? Hi. Hi. Uh, my question is related to inflammation. Uh, you mentioned inflammation and how does it relate to other diseases of the autoimmune system? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so the question is about inflammation and how does that relate to other autoimmune um, systems? Right, or diseases. Um, so that's a really good question. And it's actually, it's actually strange because there's lots of people who have uh, rheumatoid arthritis who have chronic inflammation, but they don't necessarily get diabetes or insulin resistance. So I think it gets back to where is the inflammation? And um, if it's in the adipose versus somewhere else systemic, you know, if it's arthritis in the knee or something. So I, I think the, I, I can't exactly answer that question, but I could tell you that we have to think carefully about where's the inflammation happening and is it just a cell communicating with another cell or is there a systemic uh, infl inflammatory problem? Um, oh, okay, so the question is, um, is, there, is there a problem with having t too many good macrophages? Um, so as far as I know, the answer should be no, because those are their, they're kind of maintenance macrophages that would um, uh, keep the tissue healthy. And um, to date, no one's been able to turn the bad macrophages good, but um, we know that those good macrophages are necessary. And if you don't have the good macrophages, you get or obese and diabetes. So they're certainly good, and we would hope to have more. Including the pro-inflammatory cytokines. Can you uh, say that again? Do, don't the adipocytes themselves turn into macrophages secreting pro-inflammatory cytokines in an advanced stage of obesity? Yes. Okay. So his question was, do, do stem cells turn into adipocytes and don't they secrete pro-inflammatory cytokines? Yeah. So the answer is yes. Um, there's there's uh, stem cells or pre-adipocytes, pre-adipocytes that turn into adipocytes. And those can actually um, secrete inflammatory cytokines like MCP1 and TNF-alpha. So um, in, in the beginning when I was showing that in the question why we don't know why these macrophages moving into the adipose tissue. So one of the, one of the root causes is probably some stress to the tissue. So there's an initial stress that then ca calls in more macrophages and then it's just an ongoing chronic process. But yes, in the beginning there's something coming from the adipocytes or the fat cells. So there's something coming. It's, it's just not known yet. Yeah, yeah, so her question is, are the fat cells causing the macrophages to move in? And, and the answer is yes, yes. So there's something, there's some stress, and maybe it's because they're so full of fat. Um, there's something called ER stress, which is endoplasmic reticulum stress, where they just can't handle the protein. They just can't handle processing so many proteins. Um, it could be the fatty acids, like saturated fatty acids as opposed to like the good omega-3 fatty acids like in olive oil. Um, but really, I mean, if you ask any researcher, they're, of course what they study is the most important. But um, I mean, there's a, a million reasons. But yes, it's the primary source is the fat cells. Okay, we have another question from the chat room. I'm just gonna quote some word for word. I'm wondering why some obese individuals don't get diabetes. Could it be genetic or other background regulation of inflammation that contribute to whether or not the person gets diabetes? 
Yeah, okay, so the, so the question is, why, why do some obese people not get diabetes? And that's the million dollar question. And I, I think there is just underlying genetics um, and susceptibility. So, uh, I mean, a, a huge part of who we are is, is genetics and exposures. So I think the, the answer is we've got to study those people. Like, why are they, why, why are they obese but protected from getting diabetes? It's just, it's just unclear right now. Okay. Yes, I have a question regarding how do you handle the information. Something like turmeric or xanthalum, xanthalum, I'm not pronouncing okay. it correct. Do you, are you familiar with those two things and which handles the information better? Uh, okay, so the question is how do you handle the inflammation and you yes. listed turmeric and xanthalum? Or? Astaxanthin. Astaxanthin. It's a Astaxanthin. Brand new one. Just ask. Okay. It's antioxidant. Okay, so I haven't heard of that one. I've heard of turmeric. <laughs> I've, I've heard of turmeric. Um, so these are basically nutrients, like a nutraceutical. Um, I, I, think, I, I think there's scientific evidence to support that some nutrients are beneficial, you know, blueberries or, or something. But I think until there's actual, uh, the, the gold standard in research is a randomized control trial where you actually give this to a huge number of patients and see if there's an effect. I'm not so sure those studies have been done with turmeric or the other, the other one you mentioned, but um, I think, and this is, so I'm not a physician, I'm not a doctor, I'm, I'm a researcher, but my personal opinion is, um, you know, eat healthy, <laughs> try to choose healthy foods. Um, you know, I think some people try to take these nutrient supplements, but then they go to McDonald's or they, uh, you, you know, use wrinkle cream, but they smoke cigarettes. And, you know, you've just got to think about what you're doing and be conscious of what you're eating and putting on your body. Okay. Any special kind of diet that can control or increase the, your good uh, macrophages? Okay, is there any diet that increases the, the, the good macrophages? Um, so don't eat a high fat diet. Um, <laughs> uh, um, I'm trying to think, I, I can't think of any research um, pertaining to that question, but in general, if you eat a lot of saturated fatty acids, there's more inflammation. And this is shown in cell culture, this is shown in animal models, and in human epidemiological studies. So saturated fatty acids like in red meat or um, pork or, or lots of fat. Um, if you eat the omega-3 fish, fish fats, that those are healthy and good for you. They tend to be anti-inflammatory. So I think, I think, you know, it's that Mediterranean diet, it's portion control. Um, so eating more of the, the healthy, healthier fats. So all fats, not bad, there's good fats too. So try to eat the good fats. Okay, we got one more question back here. Kind of playing off what you just said in the types of fats, could you speak a little bit in about your diets and the composition of the fats? Because you mentioned the, the saturated, the, the acylcarnitines and, and yeah, so. Okay, so you're asking about the composition of the diets. Um, um, so, the, so the lard, lard is basically a lot of palmitate and a lot of saturated fatty acids. Um, it's, it's pork fat. Um, then the, the, the junk food diet, the cafeteria diet is kind of fat from everywhere. And I probably can't speak to that, getting, getting to what we were talking about where, you know, there's increased labeling and they, in, they, they list the trans fat, but we don't know exactly if it's palmitate or something. But, um, you know, we didn't, we didn't feed them fish or anything. We fed them pepperoni. So we, we basically went for the worst type of diet you could imagine. And, um, um, if, if you really want to talk more in detail, I could give you, like, we got our diets from Research Diets Incorporated, the, the pellet diet, so we can talk more about, you can, you can actually go on the internet and see what the composition of the diets is. Okay, do we have any more questions? I thought we had some from down here. Okay, well, why don't we take this question and I'll come to you, Scott, okay? Can you please um, explain further the relationship between inflammation and insulin resistance? Yeah, <clears throat> so that I can answer. <laughs> um, and, um, 
I should have had a slide, but this is basically molecular biology, and I didn't know, you know I didn't want to get too boring here. But basically, insulin signals through its insulin receptor and turns on a lot of different pathways inside of a cell. And um, inflammation, like cytokines, like TNF-alpha that I measured, um, signal through other receptors and turn on other pathways that block insulin signaling. So basically, TNF-alpha turns off insulin signaling. So it's, it's, it's not that we don't have enough insulin. In fact, your body, when you're obese, your body makes more and more insulin to try to compensate. It's just your insulin doesn't work. So it's dysfunctional. It's called insulin resistance. And eventually, you get diabetes. And diabetes is when your pancreas, your beta cells just give up and they just, you just basically, your insulin doesn't work at all. And your glucose, is, your, your blood sugar starts going up. Okay. Scott, you had a question. You have three questions from the chat room. All right. It's not all my brother asking questions? No, actually not. Um, first one is, does personality have an effect on diabetes and gaining weight? And what he means by that is type A versus type B, oh. aggressive versus placid. I, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, uh, I mean, I would only be guessing. Um, I mean, obviously, depression increases, you know, you eat more when you're depressed, but I can't answer, I have no idea about that behavior, okay. behavior. I, I don't study behavior. N next one is, are the mice fed several times a day versus one large high caloric feeding? Nope. Um, so, yeah, so that's a good question. Um, so it's not like a binge eating. It is, um, they are, they're in a cage and there's a little thing where their food is kept. So they have, it's called ad libitum, so they have access to the food as much as they want. And then finally, maybe, what is the quickest, most successful way to reverse the infiltration of bad microphages into the adipose tissue? Okay, gastric bypass surgery has been shown. So if you, if you decrease obesity, you can decrease your, macrophage, your bad macrophages. Um, there's a diabetes drug, um, a class of drugs that work on um, receptors that basically, that can decrease inflammation and... Um, I'm trying to think of the, the name. I mean, is it Avandia? I, I'm really horrible because I'm not a physician. But uh, basically, there's certain diabetes drugs that also decrease inflammation. So there's, there's ways out there right now, um, losing weight, the gastric bypass surgery, um, and this, these drugs can help decrease uh, obesity, obesity-associated obesity, obesity macrophages. Yeah. Are there any specific diet-related studies, animal studies, uh, pertaining to adiponectin levels and BMI relation? Okay, so your question is about adiponectin levels and BMI. Yes, yeah, so there's lots of studies about adiponectin. And so adiponectin is like a hormone, just like insulin, and it is a, a good hormone. And um, so the bad news is the more obese you become, the less of this hormone you have. And there's actually a ton of work out there showing that you need adiponectin to be healthy, that if you have low adiponectin, you have more cardiovascular disease, more heart disease, um, more diabetes. Um, adiponectin helps burn fat and burn energy, so you want lots of adiponectin. So the good news is that if you lose the weight, so you lose weight, you have more adiponectin. Okay. Oh, another question back here. All right. <laughs> so, so in terms of trying to parse out what's happening in regards to the actual dietary intervention that you give, have you looked at using, you know, say a genetic model of obesity in rats and actually trying to parse out to see if the actual diet itself is different? Okay. So the question is about dissecting out what part of the diet is causing the obesity by possibly using genetic models of obesity. Um, so I, so a genetic model of obesity is something that might lack adiponectin or, um, um, or, or leptin. Uh, so no, we haven't done that yet. Um, that's one option where you can start basically in, in a mouse model, you can delete or get rid of certain genes and then that can help you guess which pathway is important. So we haven't done any of that yet. No. Are there any other questions? Okay. Well, we would like to. Oh, I'm sorry, ma'am. Yeah. Go ahead. Do 
Um, so your guess is how soon this will, or my guess uh, on how soon this will translate to humans. Um, so in terms of a drug or something, I have absolutely no guess. Um, uh, there's already some drugs on the market for diabetes that improve the macrophage profile or the macrophages. Um, I am sure this has been an extremely hot topic for the past, you know, 15 years. The, the NIH, the National Institute of Health, is really funding obesity research. Um, obesity leads to certain cancers, so there's tons of research money right now. I would hope that that translates to human, human uh, drugs soon. But the reality is, you know how long it takes to get something approved by the FDA. And so it really starts with an idea in a lab or a company, probably 10 years of research. And then, you know, it's a long time. But let's hope that other, other labs or companies are already working on this that, uh, you know, are patented and secret that we don't know about yet.